Roxo Media House. Welcome back to another episode of Facing the Frogs. Jamie Plunkett here alongside Coach David Bowden. We are taking a look at the Kansas Jayhawks today. Coach, it's a crazy world we live in. Kansas is 5-0. and They've beaten West Virginia at West Virginia. They just beat Iowa State at home this past weekend, which is what we're going to take a look at here in a moment. Game day is going to be in Lawrence for this game. Uh, what is happening with the Jayhawks right now? Well, I, what's happening is is Lance Leipold is a program builder. And, um, you, you know, you look back to his days at Wisconsin Whitewater, and, yes, it's a Division three uh, football program. It was an absolute power. And, and Jamie, I, I, you know, I don't care what you say. Football is football at any level, right? You know, and, and so building a program, culture, those things translate as you go up in levels. And, and, and certainly it's translated for Lance from going from – 109 and six at Wisconsin Whitewater, and we're talking the days where uh, Mount Union, you know, he's battling those guys as a, another Division three power, um, and then you know, obviously had success at Buffalo, right? I just said that at success at Buffalo, and then now he's come to, to Kansas and done the same thing in short order. You know, after the, the, his last year, excuse me, when we first got there, he met his team for the first time after spring football, and so you know what he's done. From that point till now, you know, fans are talking about it. They're, they can see that, the, the you know, the, the, they play hard for each other. There's a strong culture. I mean, just look at the quarterback alone, a kid from California, and we'll get to get into that for, for sure. But for him to stay at Kansas, right, and kind of go through some of those growing pains, um, it, it just speaks to the job that, that Coach Leipold and his staff are doing, and they've been together um, a long time. Shout out to Coach Leipold. You know, you've got to imagine that his name is going to be at the top of some search lists here this offseason. Nebraska and Wisconsin specifically come to mind as as two schools that might try to get him away from the Jayhawks. But like you said, he's trans transformed this program really quickly. Uh, we're going to take a look, folks, today at some film from their win over Iowa State. Iowa State played in Lawrence last weekend. The Jayhawks won that game 14-11. to You might be thinking, oh, pretty low-scoring affair. Maybe neither of these offenses are very good. It's not necessarily the cases we're going to get into with the Jayhawks offensively here in just a bit, but we're actually, Coach, going to start on the defensive side of the ball this week because Iowa State had the first offensive possession. So as we jump into film here, what can you tell me about the Jayhawks' defense? Well, you know, they have a stud safety in the, in the back who kind of runs the show, runs the back half uh, in Kenny Loggin. And uh, he's a senior safety, brings a lot of leadership, a lot of uh, snaps underneath him. He's a guy who's hung with the program uh, in the world of, uh, you know, hey, things aren't going right, I'm out. Uh, he, he's really hung in there and, and been a leader and, and, and has you know a lot of respect amongst his teammates and, and certainly the the fans at Kansas. So starting back there with him, um, you know you're going to see him all over the place. Uh, great in coverage, does a good job in run support. Uh, he'll rotate down the middle as he, he's you can see here. Um, so really it all starts with him. And then you know you go to the next level at linebacker Rich Miller, number thirty right here. Uh, he'll be in the middle of that defense, sort of the running the. As we talked about, you know, Loggin running the back half. He's going to run the front uh, and be that guy. He's a guy that came over with Coach Leipold from Buffalo, um, so there was some familiarity, obviously there, and, and was able to set the tone on on defense. And so, uh, you know, those are the guys there. And then uh, Lonnie Phelps at defensive end. We're going to take a look at him here shortly, but just want to take a look at this first play. So they're, they're in a four down. We're back to that even front, um, much like we saw at SMU. However, it's not as versatile, right? This is more of a, you're going to see a traditional four down, very old school um, approach, right? In, in a true, uh, true even front. And, and so um, they're not going to send a ton of movement and blitzes, although this first play um, they do, but it's, this is a, something that was kind of a staple of this four, four down. And that is they'll bring one. And so you'll see that creep, creeper here as they go in motion. Okay, and this this call is on. So you'll see this this guy. It looks like a blitz. He's really just become the fourth rusher because everyone's moving away from that. And this is all tied together. You can kind of see the way this defense works. He's going to be a dropper on this end. Okay, if it's a pass play, so he kind of checks. If it's run, he'll come back into the fit. All right, but so it's a bringing pressure here, stun away, and then the secondary is tied into that as well. So now you've got in order to replace this one. Okay, you're going to see the safety spin down. You're going to see this safety spin to the middle of the field, and then corners are going to bail. 
Okay, and that that's that is pretty textbook for a four down kind of base out of quarters, you know, a, a stunt, right? Where you're still bringing four people. Um, you know, again, if this is a, a run their way, then it becomes a, a five man front um, naturally. Now, one of the things I noticed, Jamie, is they go in motion here, and this isn't really a great call. You know, they stay on it. I'm, you know, I don't know if this is a miscommunication or what, but really don't want to, you know, spin the. It's almost like a, you know, it looks like a a washing machine in a way, right? Everything's going, you know, if you kind of see everything's going this way. Yep, exactly. Right. And then, you know, spinning back the other way. Well, the problem with it is now your passing strength has changed with the motion, right? You really, you're now spinning away from your passing strength. Not great. And it gets Kansas in tr a little bit of trouble. This first play, they're a little shorthanded, um, as you can see. So, um, you know, that's just something to take a look at and, and keep an eye on, um, but, but, again, that, that's a zone blitz. They drop and spin coverage. Um, and, and so that, that's something to look at. The other thing I want to note, this is a guy that's, that's opened up a lot of eyes uh, at corner. He doesn't make the play here. He's really – he's hamstrung and sort of beat by birth. But over here, this is Kobe Bryant. Okay, he's a senior corner, um, really good in coverage. But he's really made his name – um, in, in the run game, honestly. And you don't hear that often, obviously, at that cornerback position. But he does a really nice job here of fitting that thing. And, Jamie, you and I have talked about this a bunch, but just keeping that hat outside, you know, to force everything back in. So once he recognizes the ball his way, now it forces it back in. He can let these guys rally, you know, to the ball from, from inside out. He's going to work from outside in. And, and so that's how you sort of vice the ball carrier, even though they're at a disadvantage. That, that's exactly right. And you know, where his help is, and so does a nice job. He, he's really been a big time player for them. You can kind of take a look. I'm gonna let this just run through, um, but you can see their their defensive line, uh, bigger, stronger guys. They do get a little bit, you know. Sometimes you can see those guys on skates in the run game. However, they they do a good job collapsing the pocket um, in pass rush. Um, they do a good job just kind of bull rushing inside, and, and we'll continue to look at that. So the, this then it presents, I think, a different challenge for TCU's offense, right? Because even though we've seen another even front from SMU, we talked pretty much at length about the the uh, different the kind of the variety that SMU would present on defense. We saw obviously TCU's offense have plenty of success in that game, putting up 42 points. Could have probably been more. They hadn't stalled out a little bit in the third quarter there. Um, but with this one, with it being more of a, just a traditional kind of base defense, what are the ways that TCU's offense can take advantage of this on Saturday? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is, you know, they, they sort of know what to expect. So you can you can get a lot of repetitions during the week in practice versus the same fronts, right? A lot of times you have to limit your, your play menu um, against an Oklahoma last week, right? I mean, believe it or not, you know, they didn't carry a ton of stuff. Um, they said, they were, hey, we're going to run the ball for sure. And they're going to do the stuff that they feel comfortable with. But they also had to practice against all these fronts and different looks. Well, for these guys, you know, They've made a commitment to say on, on defense for, for the Jayhawks, hey, we're going to be great at something, right? We're going to play a little bit more of a gap control for, for you know, the typically uh, an even front does, but that, that's where they're going to be. They're going to line up. They're not going to make mistakes. They're not going to be out of position. They're not going to be beat by birth. So, um, you know, you, you're really not going to fool them, trick them. So you, I wouldn't expect a lot of, um, you know, trying to throw a, a lot of trick plays at them necessarily, but you can carry a, a lot of your scheme in a defense because you know it's going to be consistent, right? Yeah. Um, and, and here, I mean, you know, it's it's first and ten, and they just stay with a four-down quarters look. So what I mean, mean by that is all four guys, you see these guys at the same level. They've got a quarter of the field and pass responsibility, okay? And it, it also means that this safety is going to be a, a run support guy. Now, the ball gets out right now. This corner, he triggers on the outside. He's really got to make be careful on that one. This might be something that, that TCU can exploit you know, it's sort of a double pass, right? Because if you got someone else going out and you got two run support players right now, you know, they might be able to slip one by here, right? So it's just something to take a look at um, as we go. But it's not a ton of pressures, um, you know, and, and like I said, it's going to be it, it's going to be pretty vanilla, um, but they do it well. You know, you've you've gotten into this trend, coach, of seeing something on film in these sessions that we do, and then we get to the game day and you say, hey, remember we talked about that and facing the Frogs and TCU took advantage of it like we expected. So I'm now fully prepared for some sort of double pass trick play from the Horn Frogs on Saturday. All right, all right. We'll see. We'll see. We're going to get to some things that I think we're going to see. Uh, but, yeah, that could be one of them. I mean, you know, for, for sure. I, I hope, hope I'm right. Uh, all right, let's keep running this uh, possession for Iowa State see what we can see. 
Sure. So again, just want to get you know give you a look at these guys working up front. Um, they're not hard penetrators, right? They're going to control the gap. Um, you know, they're not going to get got defensive line that gets up the field a lot. So I want to you know kind of keep an eye on that, and uh, that helps them. You know, with with not having people run uh, gap schemes against them where they get down blocked and create lanes, right? So they're going to control the line of scrimmage, but not get too far up the field. Um, the defensive line certainly has been coached. When they get sort of the heels of the offensive line, they s- tend to flatten out and read things. That's what their defensive line does. Um, and, and so, you know, that you won't see the big kickout blocks and things like that that we saw from against Oklahoma last week um, against this defensive line. So this, you know, we saw really good improvement week to week on TCU's offensive line from SMU to Oklahoma. Part of that was Oklahoma's defensive scheme, I think, but – it's without a doubt it it was pretty clear on Saturday that the offensive line for TCU was better than they were a week prior against this defensive front for Kansas state though. Can we see more? Is there potential to see more progress from TCU's offensive line? Yeah, I think so. Especially because it's not going to have to be a lot of thinking, you know, again, they should know what to expect defensively. And then this is a good look too, Jamie, to your point. This is, this just helps the, the offensive line out is you can manipulate sort of the looks that you want, meaning um, they've Kansas have shown that the three and the two technique actually matter. It matters where they line up. Um, a lot of it has been uh, away from the passing strength, okay? So what I mean by that is the number of receivers to that side, they'll put the three technique away from it and the two technique, um, you know, to it, okay? If there's a tight end in the game, then that trumps it. They'll put the three technique to the – to the uh, tight end side that that happen that matters as they start to account for gaps well the thing that Iowa State picked up on I thought pretty astutely is that you know they're able to to manipulate some things so they'll take this this is a tight end for them that they have split out now all of a sudden you know he's inside and really for for Kansas if they would have saw this pre-snap they probably would have set the three technique to this player okay now they bring a guy in motion okay so because the defensive line is this way, the linebackers have to adjust to this stuff, right? They have to be the adjusters. So they jump bump this way, and now you come back to that same side for Iowa State. That was really, really smart for them. Um, and it's something I think you're going to see some shifts in motions to try and disrupt them a little bit, to try and get you know the, the gaps in the defensive line where they want it to be. Yeah. Um, so that's how they'll create some of those – you know, some of those matchups that they want. Yeah, you might, and you might, folks, you might look at this box score or just even the score from this this Kansas-Iowa State game and think, well, Iowa State only scored 11 points. Like Kansas defense is either really good or Iowa State's offense is really bad. But neither of those things are, are the case, I don't think, because with Iowa State, I mean, they outgained Kansas as far as yardage is concerned on the day. They had over 300 yards of offense to only, I think, 213 for Kansas. Uh, but their kicker missed three field goals. They left a lot of points on the board after – putting together relatively successful possessions, getting into the red zone, getting into scoring position. So uh, it's pretty cool to see that there's uh, potentially an opportunity here for the Frogs to once again get out there and, and take advantage of some things and put some points on the board. Yeah, there's there's no question. This is a good football team. I mean, yeah. you know, I, I, if there's any doubt left, um, I know with game, game day there and all that, this is not a fluke. This is a solid football team. Who they're not going to beat themselves. It's going to be a team that that's going to be sound in all three phases, uh, for sure. And, and and so you've got to do some different things. And Iowa State does here. And what you can tell by what this tells me, Jamie, is that this is not a field defense. Okay. And so what do I mean by that? Well, first of all, Iowa State goes tempo. You can tell it gives them a little bit of trouble, right? They're not getting lined up here. Okay. So um, so that's a, that's an issue. The tempo is part of it. The other part of it is. This offensive formation is called FIB, okay? It stands for formation in the boundary. So their formation is into this boundary side. You'll see, you know, obviously they've got three receivers into the boundary, single receiver up top by himself. So it's an FIB formation with tempo. So now because they're not a field defense, meaning they don't set their defense to the field, all right, to the field here, a lot of people will set their personnel as this is the strength regardless of the formation. Okay, so there's really two schools of thought there. You can either go by form by uh, field and boundary, or you can go by personnel and formation. Okay, formation strength. If it's balanced and everything's balanced and the balls and you know balls in the middle of the field, a lot of people will set their defense to the quarterback's throwing arm, right? Whether he's a righty or lefty, that you know if everything's balanced up, um, say that say the running backs in a pistol and they got two by two, 
then that that would be the last sort of way to to, to call the defense. But all of that to say this, you know, TCU has tempo in their repertoire. They've got a tight end. You know, they got multiple tight ends that obviously that we've seen, and they do have different personnel groupings. This is really smart. To all of a sudden, you know, they they pick up a first down here. So on first down, they're still moving the chains up here. You can see them just getting set. They they get into a FIB formation in tempo, and they have these running linebackers all running around all over the place, right? They're just you know trying to scramble to get lined up, and they just get the ball out, you know, something quick and easy. That's something that I would look for, for TCU to try and get them into some formation of the boundary, um, some quick tempo things with different looks. I think that's key, and then that way they're you know again their their defense can't get set in time, and then advantage TCU in that case. Yeah, anytime you can potentially put one of these CC wide receivers, these big guys out in space one on one, Quentin Johnston, Savion Williams, who's had really good success the last couple of weeks, even uh, Jordan Hudson, freshman out there, um, you, you're going to like the the results most likely. That's right, and and again, and again, this is another example of just four down quarters, right? Their defense is about as exciting as the state of Kansas, um, and so you know it, it just you're not going to see a lot, but they're they're good at it. You know, they, they execute, um, but they're, they, they're not going to get fooled by this de- this Kansas defense. They're just going to have to go out and, and execute and beat them. Uh, they'll know again where they're going to be lined up. And execution wins 90% of the time, right? That's right. Like execute, like just doing your job. I don't think people realize in football how mu- how important every single person, if you just do your job, the, the, you're creating p- plenty of opportunity for success. Yeah, no, absolutely. If, if one guy has a bust on defense, then it could be a, a house call. And, and, and that's why you do, you do that. That's why you have, you know, a, a base defense that's um, somewhat vanilla. And those, that's the advantage of that is that, hey, we're not going to give up the big play, right? We're going to keep things in front of us. We're going to be sound. Hey, we may give up a, a few plays, but their objective, the objective of this defense is to keep making the offense snap the football. If, if they can increase them to snap the football to get to the end zone, then bad things are going to happen for the offense. And they can, you know, try and create takeaways that way, or at least turnover on downs. Yeah, and we saw that. We saw exactly that on Saturday with Iowa State missing field goals. That's right. And you know, to, to your point, Kansas is five and zero, right? This this quote unquote vanilla defense has kept their opponents uh, scoring fewer points than them every game this year so far, and that's really at the end of the day all you can ask for. Right. All right. Let's keep rolling here. What do we see? So we're we're now uh, they, they you know pick up five, so it's second and five here. Um, Again, this is something I haven't seen in a while. This was a, a, a staple of this four down sort of, you know, true four three defense. Um, that the tilt nose, and we're going to talk about, you know, some of the, some of the advantage of that. Um, but again, it's it's um, a, a tilt nose <clears throat> up front, and it's still a four down. And then I want to show you something on trips. Okay, you want to talk about something that we could see on Saturday? This is something I would attack ten times out of ten. All right. So this defense here against trips so you can see the three receivers for iowa state okay this safety back here all right we used to call it alert there's different names for it but in this defensive structure he's got a key number three the third receiver so we always talk about counting from outside in so this is receiver number one number two this is the the number three receiver for them okay for the defense so he's got that guy vertical all right, he, he can't be peeking back here. He's got to make sure that he knows that this guy's not vertical first. If he's underneath, he's fine because he can give it to the linebackers and pass it off and continue to sink or, or, or what, what have you. But what happens here is his eyes are completely in the backfield, all right? And so this is a, an aggressive – he's a good player. We talked about him to open the show, yeah. all right? But this is sometimes he's an aggressive player and you can get after him. What I would do is I would line up in trips just like this. Okay, they, they fake some screen out here. They go play action. They don't throw it to him, but this guy's going to be screaming, okay, down the opposite hash if they would just would have went there on play action. Okay, they hand the ball off. And so it is what it is. But, I, you know, if I were Iowa State and they never went back to it, if you're up top, some coach has to catch that. Say, hey, this guy's triggering really early. He's not alert to number three vertical. Go some kind of play action and send him, even if it's, even if it's four verticals, you know, you send this guy down the hash, this guy's got the numbers, this guy's got the opposite hash, and you send another one up the numbers. But look for a play action on Saturday with trips, number three vertical um, for the Horn Frogs, and, and hopefully that'll be the one, Jamie, I think. If you want to put your money on one, that's put it, it on me. this one right here? Yes, sir. All right, so player-wise, 
who's normally lined up at the third receiver if they go trips? Is that like Darius? Is that Jaquarius Spivey? Who's out there normally on that role? Yeah, they've, they've mixed it up depending on the personnel grouping. Um, you know, sometimes they've had that, like we talked about that nub tight end on the backside. And so it'll be another slot. They've, they've had Tay Barber there, but it's really, it's been Darius. Um, so yeah, it could be a, a multitude of guys depending on the personnel grouping. But uh, when you're that open, or if you're it that doesn't open, matter. Not, no, it doesn't matter. It doesn't yeah. matter. Exactly. All right, well, right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that it's going to be Darius, and Darius is going to have a long touchdown on Saturday. All right. Well, good. Uh, well, then uh, if you put your money on mine, I'll put my money on yours. Yeah, let's do it. Uh, we're looking here, though, at that tilt. I'm going to go back to this and just some of the advantage of this tilt nose guard here. you got a three technique from Kansas here, and then you've got this tilt playing into the center. And so, again, you know, we're going to talk about the offensive line sort of being a little bit undersized, athletic offensive line. This is typical of sort of an undersized nose guard. You know, if you're going back to high school football and you've got that little nose guard that, you know, that, that causes havoc for the center, you'll put him in a tilt. And the reason you'll do that is you'll kind of play off his, his snap hand usually. Um, it, you know, you, want to, you can go right at it. Um, but it, it, it forces teams to double team you a lot of times, right? Forces a double team. Well, you think, well, why, why do you want a double team? That's, that can't, that's not a good thing if you're getting doubled. Well, if you're getting doubled, of course, then that means one guy's not coming up, to, you know, to block your linebacker, right? They're getting off the line. So it frees up your linebackers. So it creates double teams. Um, you can also crowd the ball a lot of times, to be honest with you. Like a lot of times these guys are off sides and don't get called just by the, the vantage point. That's right. Yeah, exactly. So you can really crowd the ball. It helps with your pass rush. Um, and, and, you know, and so there's, there's a lot you can do. And then a lot of times these guys will read the opposite guard so that it gets a good look. If you've got a puller or something, they're able to see through this guy, you know, and read the, read the guard uh, really easily. So there's a lot you can, you can do there, um, you know, for, with that tilt. And it's just something that, again, you just don't see in college football very often. Um, it was, like I said, about a decade ago, it was in vogue all over the place. Lastly, on this end zone view, I just want to highlight, so the, the defensive ends for Kansas are really good, Lonnie Phelps and Jeremy Robinson. And, and so here they play a tight seven technique, which is the inside eye of the tight end, to almost a head-up six, okay? And, and this is different. A lot of teams that play this defense, if they line up in a seven technique, they have to actually have their eyes on the tackle and they're reading the tackle. So if they get a down block, you know, he'll squeeze as well that sort of thing. This one here, his actually eyes is playing, they're on the tight end. So again, we talked about different schools of thought. This is, is two ways you can approach it. You can you say, all right, I want to have eyes so I can get a good read on the tackle. Or if I'm going to get in a fight some, with somebody, i.e. the tight end, I want to make sure that I have my, you know, my hands and my eyes on that guy, right? If I'm going to get in a fight, I want to make sure I'm looking at the guy I'm fighting. And that's what Kansas decides to do. You know, they, they play that. So, you know, tight ends, that, that makes it a little bit more difficult from a guy who's not you know used to being sort of soloed up, blocking, that sort of thing. Um, so that can cause problems for the TCU tight ends. You know, luckily for the Horned Frogs, you got some really good ones at that spot. Finally here, you know, third and six is now a passing down. This is when you'll see some stuff. So, again, typical of these sort of four down stuff, they'll bring in a little bit, sometimes some odd personnel um, with a nickel. On, on passing downs, and you'll see some some zone pressures from these guys. You really don't see a lot of man pressures. I, I don't think they're as confident, you know, matching up against Big 12 athletes man-to-man -man consistently. They'll do a little bit of it. Um, you know, for here, for example, it, it technically it becomes, you know, it becomes man-to-man -man, um, with with a free player, and there's only, there's only four rushers. So they, they have the two drop players, the two ends I just talked about in the last – the last down will drop. These linebackers will blitz, and you got creates a four man rush. Now the two drop players can just be kind of low hole, kind of rat players they're called. So they're they're trying to sniff out any cheese coming across the middle, right? And and so they'll take care of that. Everyone else is manned up, and really really smart. Again, that, that you know Kansas just does some really nice things um, in all three phases. But I think this is smart. You know your athletes. You know you got guys that gonna run hard, play, you know, do their responsibilities. Smart players, okay. You've got all that going for you. So go ahead and, and have a simulated pressure, four man rush. You still kind of protect yourself underneath. You've got man, and you you protect the post up top with the deep safety, and all of that amounts to a, you know a sack, a big time sack for the Jayhawks. And and this is stuff that you got to keep an eye on. So now in, in third down. We talked about, hey, you can bring a, a large play menu 
in the run game because they're pretty vanilla on run downs. But in the pass game, you got to make sure you're on top of your game in terms of pass protection. Well, I, this is going to present a really cool challenge, I think, to the Horn Frogs. On Saturday, uh, we've seen their offense find success against a variety of different defensive fronts and, and defensive schemes already through four games this year. Uh, but this is going to be a fun challenge for the Frogs, and, and I'm really looking forward to seeing what Garrett Riley and uh, Sonny Dykes come up with uh, to challenge this Jayhawks defense. So, folks, we'll be right back. We're going to take a look at the Jayhawks on the offensive side of the football right after this break. Simply the best barbecue in Fort Worth. Dine-in, catering, or drive through 2900 Montgomery, just off I-30. Remember, the best barbecue in Fort Worth is at Railhead Smokehouse. Texas-based Happy Water offers the best-tasting, sugar-free kids drink ever made. Happy Water comes in four delicious flavors that you can find at local retailers and on Amazon. Each pouch contains zero grams of sugar, zero calories, and zero percent juice. Head to happydrinks.com for more information and to purchase Happy Water. That's H-A-P-I drinks.com. Live happy. Be happy. Drink happy. T-Club provides the everyday TCU fan and alum the ability to specifically support TCU student-athletes. Flying T-Club offers three levels of memberships. The Flying T-Club is a nonprofit organization supporting the brand development of TCU student-athletes through a series of unique event-based networking opportunities, which are exclusive to our members. These events provide a great social engagement tool for our members and student-athletes alike. Follow them on Instagram at Flying T-Club or online at flyingtclub.com. For exclusive interviews and content on TCU Recruits, subscribe now at frogstoday.com. Any sport, anytime. It's your source for all things TCU. Only on frogstoday.com. Welcome back into Facing the Frogs. Jamie Plunkett alongside Coach David Bowden. We are breaking down the Kansas Jayhawks. We just talked about the Jayhawks on the defensive side of the ball, and now we're going to take a look at this Kansas offense. Coach, what are your kind of first observations about the Jayhawks with the ball? Yeah, again, you know, going to the the coordinator. So the offensive coordinator, Andy Kolnicki, uh, is a guy, again, who's been with Coach Lance Leipold throughout Wisconsin Whitewater, Buffalo, now here at Kansas. And, and so staff continuity, um, going back to sort of an old school uh, type of, of approach. Um, they want to move the, the pocket with certainly the emergence of quarterback Jalen Daniels, um, a guy who's been there. He's been there all four years. He's a kid from California who once again, you know, bought into this culture to stay at Kansas where I think a lot of people would have bounced. They had a, a you know, he wasn't starting. Um, and we're going to get into that a little bit. But um, so he's really, he's done a nice job and, and they're really smart in their approach with him. They, they try to move his launch point constantly, um, you know, so that he's throwing on the run. He's not just sitting back there all the time in the pocket. It, so that what that means is you can, you know, have a three, five, seven step drop in the pocket. So that changes your launch point, but also half sprint outs, bootlegs, um, you know, full sprint outs, three step, quick game, all that kind of stuff. So uh, do a nice job mixing it up and then have an offensive line that that's athletic up front, a little bit smaller. We're going to talk more about that. Um, but, I, you know, their, their, uh, their center, Mike Novinsky, is another kid who came with Coach Leipold from Buffalo who's really anchored that offensive line. Uh, you know, we said they're a little bit smaller and athletic, but he's a guy who's big, strong. Um, he knows the system, obviously. He's a smart guy, gets, him, you know, gets the right calls in, but he's also just one heck of a player. You know, we actually had a chance to talk to TCU defensive line coach, Coach McFarland, earlier this week uh, and, and asked him about this Kansas offensive line. This is what he had to say. Yeah, man, they're, they're a bunch as well, Coach. You can see that. They're going to be disciplined. They're going to do what they're asked to do. They're going to be who they're supposed to be. You know, a lot of times you get out there on that grass, you make a lot of adjustments. You can see in-game things that they're correcting and getting better as the game goes on. I think that's helped them versus multiple fronts that they've seen. And we've seen them adapt to it and still get positive yardage on the ground. So, Coach, you mentioned this offensive line kind of presents a unique challenge for the Horn Frogs defensively. Tell me a little bit about what is the advantage of going with speed over size on the line? Yeah, well, you can create more angle blocks, so gap blocking schemes. So, you know, we block down and pull around. Um, obviously, we talked about the quarterback movement, and so that helps with that, right? If you're moving the quarterback, a lot of times you have to move the offensive line as well. So whether that's a, a lead guy and a bootleg, which we're going to show here in a second, or just on sprint outs, the offensive line getting in front of the quarterback. Um, so a lot of movement. You, you know, you can do some things where 
Um, you know, those guys, you put them on the run and you, you uh, highlight their strengths. You know, what you're not going to see so much at is, you know, guys just hunkered in there, double teams. Um, you'll see some zone, but a lot of that is eye candy, to be honest with you, so they can get the ball out uh, on the perimeter. But, um, but it's a, a group we're going to see a ton of movement from uh, and a really good job angle, you know, on angle blocks, things like that, um, rather than just get vertical push on, on players. They're trying to get horizontal movement on players to create lanes that way uh, for their for their two transfer running backs that are that have done a really nice job. Coach, let's go ahead and take a look at what the film shows us. Yeah, so you know first play, jump right into what we we're talking about. Changing the launch point for for a quarterback Jalen Daniels. And they do that here. This is a true bootleg. We don't see uh, a heck of a lot of that. <clears throat> at least we haven't so far on facing the frogs, Jamie. Um, it's been a lot of naked bootlegs, right? We don't have and then what that means is quarterbacks out there by himself without a lead guy okay this is a true bootleg and that means they he's got sort of an escort coming down there which is the guard the guard will pull around here and you'll see him sort of be you know his bodyguard up front and allow him to to get out in the perimeter so um you know they they do some a lot of shifts in motions a lot of different personnel they actually have a fullback on the roster which i love um, I, you know, it's exciting. I get fired up anytime I, I see a fullback on the roster. They got a true fullback, a bunch of tight ends on the roster. Um, so they're gonna you know, you're gonna see a bunch of different personnel groupings. Here they it's it's a three receiver route. All right, and why that's important to note is is they're gonna do things like this where they're not sending all five guys out. They put a premium on pass protection to take care of Daniels. You know, they he's it's a lot different. It's a lot safer, even though he's a dual threat quarterback. When you see quarterback injuries, a lot of times. It's really not from the run game because they're they're the aggressor, right? They're the one that can lower their shoulder, and they know it's really you see injuries and in drop back pass, um, sitting in the pocket, and they try to avoid that as much as possible. So we'll see the bootleg here, um, and it's nice the backside nub tight end. He gets over in a hurry to create sort of that flood. You saw a quick pick slash rub route over here, and then he'll run this sail to get back out here, and then you'll get a guy in the flat. Okay, this is a flood concept because you're flooding this zone. You've got three levels here, as you can see, okay, um, on this side. And, and they'll, they'll get to this flood many different ways, right? They'll line up guys all over the place and still end up in the same three spots, right? One here, one here, and then one at the top, right? So, the, so it's really, you know, they do a, really do a nice job. They get a unique scheme, um, and they have many ways of doing the same thing, right? And that can really stress a defense, Um but but Daniels has, has done a, a tremendous job sort of running the show, um, and they've they've been smart in terms of taking care of him. All right, let's keep running this and, and see what Kansas continues to do on offense. Sure. So they you know they go ahead and pick up six there. So it's second and four on this one. And you know we talked about different angle blocks, right? Even though uh, this is there's no pullers on this play, you can see up front. We're going to look at the end zone as well, but they just want to go. A hat for hat, right? They, they again, we've talked in facing the frogs before. There's there's really only two approaches, um, you know, at least when, from a thirty thousand foot view, and that is double team the point of attack or get a hat on a hat. This is a team that wants to put um, an offensive player on each defensive player at the line of scrimmage rather than get big double teams. So they do that here, and and you know this is uh we'll go ahead and look at the the end zone as well. This is almost like a wham play. It's very unique. Um, a wham play is usually taking the, a fullback or a tight end type, H-back type body and putting him on an interior defensive player. So they're whamming him, um, and they set that up. Initially, you'll see this, this tackle here work out. Okay, and this is good to look at because TCU runs a very similar defense. Iowa State was one of the first in the Big 12 to have, play that sort of stack defense that, um, you know, that we're familiar with now. Um, but they were they were sort of at the you know they spearheaded that trend in the Big 12. So again, tackle instead of just waiting for him, he'll work work out. They're able to wham here. This is an old school hard nose play. You can see a lot of that stuff from Kansas this week. All right, coach. So it looks like they break the huddle and try to get the snap off really quickly on this next play. Yeah. So they they are you know it's a huddle team again something we have you know old, everything's old school about this program right um you don't see a lot of teams huddling up every down this one you do but they, they have a unique you know they'll, they'll go uh, sort of a sugar huddle um a little bit different where it's bunched and they do this on third and one so it's third and one all of a sudden you get quads out here to this side okay so you've got basically you got four 
tight end looking bodies, even though this is an outside receiver. And then, of course, you've got uh, it's it's unbalanced. So the, the tackles over here. So you put four players over here and a running back on third and one. You do it really fast when you break the huddle. You sprint to the line. So everyone's thinking, okay, they're coming here with a run, all right, to pick up the first down, right? Sure. Makes sense. So go ahead and let it play. They go play action there. They ride it. Do a great job to a wide open tight end. He stumbles a little bit or else he would have had a, a much bigger gain. Um, again, they just don't have the, the breakaway speed necessarily across the board. They have some of it, um, especially at running back. Uh, but, but again, this is stuff that they'll do. They'll just give you a, a totally different look and, you know, give you a certain presentation where you think, oh, it's got to be run to pick up on third and one, and it'll surprise you. It's a really smart scheme. I think they do a nice job. I think they play to the quarterback's strength, um, both quarterbacks. So we've seen two quarterbacks in there. Um, and, and they've done a really nice job matching those strengths. And this is something, Jamie, going back, this is the first drop back pass we'll see uh, from the Jayhawks. They stay in the pistol, meaning that running backs uh, behind the quarterback. A lot of times in, in drop back pass, people will you know, bring the, the running back up for protection. Kansas stays there because it's first down. They want to give more of a run look uh, to the defense. Again, lots of shifts and motions. We continue to see their tight ends line up all over the place. They'll split out. Again, to, to sort of mess with you in terms of their you know, your numbers and your count, your passing strength. And then this is their tight end who split out at the slot who ends up on the opposite side attached to the formation. You know, just throwing a lot at the defense to make sure that they, you know, they get their calls right, they get lined up, and you're trying to, they're trying to create advantage pre-snap with those things. Um, but this is an example here, you know, trying to get the ball underneath. They misfire, but, it, again, this is what they want to do. Early in the games, they want to get the ball underneath – to their receivers and their tight ends so they can open up stuff down the field later on. So it's just like we've talked about on Facing the Frogs a couple of times now. This is their first offensive possession. So we're seeing from Kansas kind of the the foundation of their game plan. This is this is the uh, these are the formations, these are the plays that they're going to be building off of and building off of for the rest of the game. That that's exactly right. You know, plant the seed now right and, and and try and again plant the cheese right and and let them take it early so they can go up top later on and and again you're seeing uh tons of formations shifts motions personnel groupings you can see all of that stuff from the jayhawks on saturday so next here jamie we got uh split back split backs with with uh orbit motion this high motion that you see this way um and and, and so they brought motion from the slot they'll now bring motion from the outside receiver and this is sort of an option kind of look. Um, but what they're doing is they're now reading this big nose guard. So, again, when you're under, a little bit undersized, there's another thing, you know, going back to that offensive line. Um, and, and I don't say that as a knock. A lot, I think they're really athletic. I think it's a really solid offensive line. However, when you've got this kind of beef in here, right, at the, the nose guard position, you can either block them or read them. And, you know, a lot of times when you have good players on the other end, you decide to read them because you don't have to go ahead and, and, and you know, try and match up uh, from a blocking standpoint. I mean, you so force, they just, You force them to make a decision rather than just trying to go man on man. That's right. Yeah. Yep. And so you see they'll, they'll block. They sort of split this thing. You know, they're blocking this way. These guys are blocking this way. And they're reading this nose guard. Okay. This was big back when, you know, the Chip Kelly days at Oregon, you know, reading interior players once the zone read sort of evolved. And that's what you're seeing here at nose guard. You know, if he chases this thing and we'll get and let it run. But, it, you know, if he would have chased, uh, chased this thing this way, then now the quarterback, okay, would take it right here. All right. You can kind of see that thing start to open up. Right. So, I mean, a lot of options. You know, you, you could also – you've also got a pitch man now because you have that orbit motion. So, I mean, this is dangerous stuff. This is really good scheme. Um, it, it creates a lot of matchup problems, and, and defensively for the Horn Frogs, you've got to be prepared and you've got to know your assignments ahead of time, and you've got to communicate, over communicate, echo calls, talk to lines as things are happening, as shifts in motion are happening. There has to be some recall, and I know they'll have a, you know Coach Gillespie, the defense coordinator, will have plenty of checks in place based on their their shifts in motions where they can automatic check to certain things and, and get it done quickly. So while it, it seems like for TCU's offensive staff they have kind of one or two things that they're really basing their whole offense on as far as attacking Kansas's defense for Joe Gillespie this week the challenge is much more varied 
There's no question. There, it, there's no question about it. Um, you know, th- this offense is going to throw everything at you. Um, and it's not, you know, I say that, but I don't want it to sound like it's gimmicky um, because it's not. It's still really good football. Um, <clears throat> again, some, some old school concepts, some things where they're trying to get angles on people, um, you know, create lanes, like I said, uh, horizontally. Um, but the presentation of it is all over the map from personnel groupings to formations to shifts and motions. And so, yeah, they're going to have their hands full on Saturday from that standpoint. It's almost it's almost not not identical, but it's uh, similar to the, the style of TCU's offense this year where where you're just you're throwing a lot of different formations at folks. I mean, we saw TCU run that orbit pre-snap motion on Saturday against Oklahoma where Duggan put the guy in motion read the defensive end, and then kept it and ran for like 37, 40 yards. For, for sure, and that's a good segue, Jamie, for this one because this is their, you know, this is their backup quarterback, Jason Bean, and at this point right now on this play, he was their, their starter last year for nine games. Um, but when you watch this here, okay, this is the same exact play that TCU runs except, you know, we've seen a bunch that you just talked about, right, the, the, the 67-yard run was exactly this. It was an arc play, you know, arc play block from the tight end. He arcs. This is the read player that you're you're referring to. So you're exactly right. This is the play right here that Max Duggan. Except Kansas, they in, now they they go with this motion guy. So they now have an extra extra blocker. They go this guy across the formation. So he's an extra blocker. So now you've got three guys for the quarterback instead of one. You know, out in front of them. So it's even more dangerous. Honestly, it's. It's that same play, um, but with extra blockers in front of the quarterback, and, and they picked up a big gain, although uh, I think see, they got him. see the little hanky come out. Yeah, that's right. right. A little laundry on the field. Uh, got a holding penalty. This actually sets Kansas back well behind the, the chains and, and kind of out of rhythm. Yeah, it, they are out of rhythm. It's third and 17, and, you know, this one here I, I thought um, after watching the film and going back to different games, you know, they have confidence in, in this offense, but I was surprised to see this one. They're just past the 50-yard line. No, it's third and 17. Typically a screen down, you know, screen draw down. You, you, you know it's tough to dial up a pass that's, you know, guaranteed 17 yards. Uh, however, I was surprised to see, you know, this call on third and, third and 17. Uh, they just run, you know, a, 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 just a dart play with the, tack, uh, the, the, uh, the running back, which is just pulling the tackle and wrapping him. Uh, around and on third and 17 they so they pull this one everyone else blocks down away from it so now we've seen pullers from all over we've seen you know zone reads inside we the run game they're going to bring a, a ton of things at at the horn frogs um they better pick up a couple and then you know ends up forcing uh forcing the punt on that one and and so you know look it, it's it, it's a they, they want to make sure that they play smart and sound. They're not going to take a bunch of chances. That that shows you right there, Jamie, at third and 17. They just want to kind of play it safe, play a field position game. But that's what they're going to do. They extend games because they're in the huddle. They're not snapping the ball as many times. Um, so you're going to see that. And everything ties together, right? They have a defense that keeps everything in front of them, yeah. um, right? They're not going to give up big plays. Offensively, they're going to be smart and sound. Use, you know, field uh, time of possession, um, and then, you know, make sure you, they play a game of field possession. So I, I think, again, there's a million ways to skin a cat, but I think for these guys, it's all aligned, right? And that's what Lance Leipold has done. In addition to all the culture that everybody's talking about, he's done a nice job in terms of program alignment, making sure that, you know, how you play defense impacts how you play offense and vice versa and your special teams and, and the weather you go for it and all that stuff. He's done a really nice job in Kansas. And, man, I'm telling you, you know, a, a well-coached TCU team, a well-coached Kansas team, both undefeated on Saturday, this one is going to be electric. It's going to be fantastic. Folks, that's going to do it for this episode of Facing the Frogs. You can catch Coach David Bowden and myself on the pregame show right before TCU and Kansas kick off this week. That's all at 11 a.m. Game day is going to be there on FS1. It's going to be a great time. We'll be alongside Marshall Newhouse as we do our regular uh, pregame show, as always, this season. Be sure to also check out the Frogs Today YouTube channel where 
uh, Brian Estridge and us and Jeff Wilson and Melissa Trebwasser and the rest of the Frogs Today staff are creating just tons of incredible content every single day of the week. And as always, check out frogstoday.com for all of your needs when it comes to TCU athletics. I'm Jamie Plunkett for Coach David Bowden. We'll see you next time. Go Frogs. Roxo Media House.